come chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh, come and chat with Nick. Well, hi, everyone. We've got Annie Margarita Yang with us tonight, and she's an accomplished best selling author on Amazon. We're going to talk about some of the books that she's written. We're going to talk about personal branding. We're going to talk about how you can build your personal brand and some of the tools and techniques you can use, even if you aren't terribly exciting like me at building your online profile. So Annie, great to have you on board. Nicholas, thank you so much for having me on your podcast today. I want to put something in here real quick for your listeners, yeah. because this is about secret strategies on personal branding from the five-day job search. I want to give your listeners a special offer. If they listen until the very end of this podcast, they will learn how to get a 10% off discount on a signed paperback copy of the five-day job search. So stick around. Yeah, well, that'll definitely motivate folks to stick around. Yeah. So you you heard it, guys. All right. So Annie, where in the world are you right now? Right now, I'm based in Boston, Massachusetts. Let's get straight into it. How did you become a best-selling author? Well, that's a great question. I became a best-selling author without even knowing it. So really, what happened was I was researching what other authors did. When I bought my house, I got signed up on all these like marketing emails from my mortgage company. <laughs> and then they were like marketing this uh, series of talks. And in the email, they put bios of other people. All of the bios were like, so-and-so is best-selling author of blah, 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 book that I have never heard of. And then I was like, is this person really a best-selling author? I've never heard of this person, never heard of this book. So I decided to search the book on Amazon. And I saw that this person had like 10 reviews on their book. And I was like, how on earth is this person a best-selling author when my first book, 1001 Ways to Save Money, has right now 179 reviews? Right. We've we've sold over 2000 copies of that book. And I'm like, if I've I have more reviews, I'm assuming I sold more copies of the book than this person did. Why am I not a best selling author? And I found out that Amazon has 16,000 categories. Oh. So if you can just somehow rank in the top 100 of any of those 16,000 categories, all of a sudden you can call yourself an Amazon best selling author. And then. <laughs> I checked the ranking of 1001 Ways to Save Money. Lo and behold, it was number 38 in like the personal money management and budgeting category. So all of a sudden I was like, I'm a best-selling author too. Exactly. Well, I think what that goes to is about finding your niche. And I think a lot of people think, how am I ever going to be Joe Rogan? How am I going to be uh, Stephen King in terms of fame and fortune? And sometimes... It doesn't, you don't need to sell a million copies. You don't need to have global reach. You need to be well known in your specific niche. And I think that's what we're going to talk about today as well as how to discover your particular niche and how you can use that to build your, your profile online. So talking about that. So that's, I was going to ask you a little bit earlier, what's an interesting thing we didn't know about you? So best-selling author, I love it. Give, a, give me a little nugget so that we can start this conversation off nicely. Interesting thing you didn't know mm -hmm. about me. I mean, I think I share so much about my career online. It's hard. But one thing is I'm allergic to chocolate. That's a surprising fun fact about me. Now, but in the book itself of the five-day job search, I explained this story. Yeah. I grew an addiction to chocolate because okay. I was depressed. I, I didn't like the way my career was going. And at some point, I became a foot fetish model. Yeah. So, and so that is quite different, yeah? Yeah. From the trauma of that experience, I had difficulty being present with my own body. So I ate a whole bunch of chocolate to deal with that traumatic stress. And then I ate like three bars of chocolate a day to the point where I was pre-diabetic, almost borderline pre-diabetic at 19 years old. And then a few months later, I decided to get allergy tests for food. Found out I was allergic to chocolate. I think my body was basically trying to communicate to me. You've eaten so much chocolate. You can't eat any more chocolate for the rest of your life. 
that's quite a story. I must be honest. Chocolate makes me swell up as well. I mean, gives me, I've got an allergy as well. I, I no, I, I, I really? put on weight. I put on weight when I eat chocolate. So I don't know if that's, I'm allergic to it or oh. I'm, I just like it, like it too much. But yeah, I, I don't think there are millions of people out there with, with a chocolate allergy, but I'm sure a lot of people wish they had a chocolate allergy. <laughs> I, but, I don't wish it on people. But you made an interesting point there in terms of your career wasn't going the way that you wanted to. What are some of the things that you did? Or why don't you just, before we step into that, because that's an exciting topic, why don't you talk about where are you now? Who are you? What is your background other than the chocolate allergies? I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York to Chinese working class immigrants. We were really frugal growing up, but we also didn't have much because they were the only ones here. No one to support my parents when they were here. Came out with only $400. A straight A student all, in, all throughout high school. And then at 16, I realized I've been in school my whole life. Doesn't make sense to go straight to college because what if my passions don't lie there? So I did not go straight to college. I was the 0.01% of my high school graduating class that didn't even get into college because I didn't apply. Yeah. And then after that, I worked a whole string of minimum wage jobs. At some point, I did the foot fetish modeling thing because my ex-boyfriend said it would be a good idea to earn quick and easy money. <laughs> Not a good idea. And then I eventually did go to community college and online college. I got a degree in communications. After that, I continued to work a whole string of minimum wage jobs one of them being Domino's Pizza, a very memorable and positive experience, in fact. And then I moved to Boston. I applied for accounting jobs with no accounting degree. I applied to 50 jobs a day. And by the end of my first week of applying, I landed an accounting job offer. That job was toxic. Got another accounting job with no accounting degree, <laughs> this time in six days. And then a year later, I, I applied again. For other jobs, I got it in five days. And then I wanted to start my own accounting firm while working a full-time job. So I was building that side hustle. And then sometime last October, I November, I got this idea to write the five-day job search. So I've been working on this as a project ever since. Well, that's super exciting. And I suppose the five-day job search, I mean, we won't give away too much of it in while we're talking now because we want folks to read that, obviously. But one of the key elements you brought up there is that you didn't put in one, one CV a day. It was quite, quite a volume. I think people think that if I send out one or two, I'll get some feedback, maybe two a day. That's quite a lot. Talk to me maybe about how volume is important when you are, when you're looking for jobs. Yeah. I, my personal philosophy is you go big or you go home. Actually, when I was applying to 50 jobs a day, I personally didn't even think that was a huge number. I personally thought 100 a day would have been a lot. 50 a day, I thought this is doable because if you upload your resume to Indeed, LinkedIn, or the other site that I used was ZipRecruiter, you can use the one-click apply. So 50 a day, I mean, I'm literally sitting at the computer for 60 minutes going like, apply, right? Like it's literally only like, what, one minute per application? I mean, yeah. there's nothing much to it. It didn't seem like a really big deal to me. But then I later found out that other people think even 10 a day is a stretch. <laughs> when I attended a panel at New England Conservatory, I like to drop in on their free classes that are open to the public. I found out that one of the people who was applying for jobs to become a music professor thought that 35 for her entire job search was like a lot. I think most people, if they've done 35, that's way too much hard work. I think people yeah. send out maybe five or 10 and expect that, okay, at least after that, I'll get four or five responses. And typically that isn't what happens. No, they, what happens, this is the same as sales. I think people need to approach this with the sales mindset, right? Let's say we, I'm trying to sell something online. I reach a hundred people have come across what I have to offer. Let's say only 10% of them are actually like interested enough to go on my site. That's 10 people, but not all 10 are going to buy from me. In the end, I think maybe one or maybe one in every 200 are going to say, hey, I'm interested. I want to become your client. Uh, I, I want to buy a product. 
this is normal in the、uh, sales industry. If you can get it higher than that, you're doing excellent. That's what I personally think. So if you can apply to 50 jobs a day, you do it for an entire week. You've applied to three, 350. And the best thing about the job search is you only need one job offer. Like if if you get a one job offer, which is a good fit for you, then you've succeeded. And that's like a rate of one out of three hundred fifty, right? That's and that's much easier than trying to run a business because imagine running a business needing constantly like a new stream of clients. You'd be reaching up to thousands. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. When you were doing the 350 applications, obviously all 350 businesses weren't a perfect fit for you. No. In terms of recruiters having a look at somebody who just puts in, for example, the basic information, I try and tell my students that it's very important to put a cover letter with your applications to show that you've researched the company, you know a little bit about them, you've at least followed their Facebook page. Your approach is obviously slightly different. You are also coming from a position where you didn't have the degree that necessarily they were looking for. How did you manage? How did you manage it? First of all, I don't do cover letters. I've never written a cover letter for a job application because my personal opinion was like, who reads this stuff anymore? Like, who actually reads this and goes like, oh, that was a great cover letter. I want to give this person a job interview. Well, that was my personal opinion, and even like. Now being on the other side, hiring someone when someone writes a cover letter, I'm like, yeah, this is like really generic. It sounds like they tried to tailor it for me, but then I'm like, I mean, they don't actually know what kind of problems I'm struggling with, so they can't actually try to like say we're the perfect fit for you. So I totally just completely ignore the cover letter. In terms of what was the other question? It was a two part question.、Attention. If I can just say, how can I say? If I use a masculine term, you had. Quite a lot of balls going for a job that you didn't have the qualifications for. How did you, even when once you got that call back, how did you deal with that situation? Ah, well, because I'm just I'll preface it with imposter syndrome that a lot of people have, even those who have got good degrees or I still have imposter good syndrome. Good knowledge. I I know、yes. what you mean. I know what you mean. I still have imposter syndrome. Don't worry. I actually have it worse than other people because even after I got the accounting jobs, I was like, I can do the work. I think. When are they gonna find out I'm not a real accountant? Like, like I'm not a real one. So I was still questioning that. I I would say I did have experience though.、Um, I worked in bookkeeping. So even though I don't have an accounting degree, I did work as a bookkeeper. You don't need a degree to work as one.、Yeah. And I took an account, a free accounting course online from AccountingCoach.com. It was taught by this accounting professor, and he was just giving away his information for free. And but but again, that's also like just very accounting one hundred and one information, <laughs> not an entire degree's worth of accounting information. I would say that what got me through to get the interview itself was the fact that I wrote one thousand one ways to save money. So when I got in the interview, people were more interested in the fact that I wrote a book than where I went to college and what I went to college for. They were like, "Wow, this is amazing! Is this a real book?" I was like. Can you define what a real book means? Because it was a self-published book, and sometimes people think self-published doesn't mean real book. They think a real book means you have to have done traditional publishing. And they were like, "Oh, real book," as in like, can I get a physical book? And then I was like, "Yes, if you order on Amazon, you can get a physical book.、Yeah. So it's a real yeah. book." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they were more impressed by that, and I asked them like, "Why are you guys more impressed by this?" Because this book took me about only three months to write, versus college took me two years to complete. I don't know. Yeah. For for some reason, people have this predisposed philosophy that if someone authored a book, they must be an expert. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a proof point. So when one is writing CVs, when you are doing interviews, and that people want to see that you've actually done what you're talking about. So by obviously, this company was interested in making sure you weren't going to spend all their money and you were going to be prudent with their finances by writing a book like a hundred thousand and one ways to save money. Obviously, ticked the box rather than somebody who said, "Well, I worked at X Y Z place for two years and did a bit of accounting." I think it also shows that you are, the, you've got the potential to take that business forward as well because you're thinking a little bit out of the box. So, authenticity and branding. Now, 
what I've seen lately in terms of branding is that large companies like your Coca-Colas, your Teslas, your Fords, etc. They've been, except Tesla, have been around for over a hundred years. They've built up their brand to such a point where if you say Ford, certain things come into your, certain things come into your head. It's becoming more and more difficult for smaller companies, which also last not as long as these companies, to build up those kind of brands. And I think a lot of people, when they're starting businesses, think I need a logo, I need a payoff line, and that will sell the business for me. Do you think that I, I feel that personal branding and having people as the face of organizations is becoming a much bigger trend? Do you find that happening? How do you use a logo for your business or do you use any? Interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's a trend. But I have had that internal debate myself. I was wondering, like, if I want to start an accounting firm, should it just be some fancy sounding name or should it be Annie Yang Financial? It was like a whole two month debate for me, actually. <laughs> My personal opinion is personal branding is much stronger than a Coca-Cola or Ford, Forbes. It's like the thing about branding is it's all about how you make someone feel. It's the impression that you leave on someone. You want to make someone feel moved, touched, loved, inspired, motivated, angry, sad. <laughs> a brand is basically trying to mimic an actual person because we as people, we have the power to influence other people, right? We go home to our spouse. We make a, like a quick snappy comment <laughs> and an argument ensues. So Feeling. Feeling is something we as humans, we do naturally. Brands are trying to mimic us as people. Yep. So if, if we are already naturally good at creating emotion, not just in ourselves, but in other people when we're surrounded by them, it's all a matter of being able to tune into that for your business. Yeah. Well, I think any young accounting you've already got something to work with. Whereas if you said crystal clear accounting or blue leaf accounting, there's no meaning in it. There's, well, it's it has no to be built, has to be built over time. I mean, you could call it green potato accounting and it could, it, it, it doesn't really matter. It takes time and money and energy to build, as you said, that brand personality into that business. Yeah. So I think that's a very interesting point to, or good point you brought up in terms of brands trying to replicate people and elicit the same kind of feelings and emotions one would get from knowing somebody. Content strategy. You've written a book in three months, you said, so you had to generate that content somewhere. I think this is pre chat GPT times as well. So you probably had to research those yourself or find that information yourself. Your personal brand on both YouTube, LinkedIn, and whatever other channels you, you're using, how do you generate your content? And are you having to generate new content every day? What is your creative process? Honestly, for the book, I was thinking about what people struggled with. They struggled to save money. I, when I was going through my own hardships, I was working like a whole string of minimum wage jobs. How can I save money while earning minimum wage? People say it's not possible. So what I did back then was I couldn't stop reading personal finance articles all the time. Every day I would wake up and also before going to bed, I would read about money. And I ended up like just trying a whole bunch of tips and I was able to save 25% of my income or more consistently, even on minimum wage. And my coworkers were asking me how I did it. My manager who made like four times what I was making asked me how I did it. He, he said he was broke and always living paycheck to paycheck, which I didn't understand. And because I kept getting this question, I decided if everyone's like struggling with this, I might as well just write a book. And then next time someone asks me this question, I'll just say, can you just buy the book rather than ask me for one hour's worth of advice each time? Exactly. Yeah. And for the YouTube channel, it was basically those ideas. At first, it was from SEO because I had researched like how to grow a YouTube channel and everything said like, oh, we have to search what people are searching for on YouTube and then create content catered to that. 
I, I eventually honestly got bored of doing that. It stifled my creativity. So I started making videos that were just based on things that I was going through in my own financial life. Like if a bank ripped me off, I'm like, interesting. This bank ripped me off. Like I had my loan on auto pay and the last payment, rather than making the last payment exactly what was left, which was six cents less than what it should be because of the rounding error at the end, they charged me the full monthly amount that I've normally been paying. And then when I called the bank, can I get my six cents back? You guys stole my six cents. This is a 0% interest loan. They were like, no, you can't get your six cents back. I mean, like it's situations like this that give me ideas for making content because it's just ridiculous. Yeah. So again, it talks about that authenticity side. So I think if you just had to follow SEO, what people are looking for and use the, the Google trends and the SEO tools on YouTube, you'd just be generating the same old thing that everyone else is doing. Even if you had to use ChatGPT to say, give me 10 topics on how to save money, there'll be 50 other YouTubers typing in exactly the same thing and generating the same content. So yours definitely would pop up because it's something that's interesting. It actually happened to you and you had some kind of, resol it's a story, it's a, res a resolution to it. So, so that's, that's very cool. Annie, you started out, you've done bookkeeping, you've done accounting, you've done all sorts of interesting things. You seem to be a marketing guru now as well. Did you ever think that you'd be a YouTube personality or a, a podcast star as well? That never crossed my mind. And you're also the first person to use the word marketing guru to describe me. <laughs> I'll take that. I was a bit taken aback by what you just said there. The YouTube, I never thought it would grow, honestly. That, the first video is what went viral. So when I say like, oh, my channel got a million views, like 80% of those views came from one video that went viral. And then I was never able to replicate that viral success ever again. Yeah. <laughs> and that wasn't even an SEO thing. That was like me watching somebody somebody else on YouTube who had no idea what she was talking about. She was complaining about her student loans. She totally mismanaged her money and she was trying to dispense financial advice. I hated watching that because like people followed her advice and admired her just because she was hot. So I made my own video on like how to save money while working minimum wage and still be able to save $5,000 a year. That went viral out of nowhere. And I wouldn't say I'm like a total marketing guru because I wasn't able to repeat that success. It was just like out of nowhere as well. But I, I'll enjoy what was handed to me as well as the podcasting. That's fairly recent. I only started reaching out to podcasts about three weeks ago. I'm booked on 50. You're number 17 that I'm doing so far. So I wouldn't necessarily say I'm great at marketing. The, re the reason I say that is you didn't study marketing, but you are doing all the right things. Or I, I believe you are starting to understand how to do the right things. And I, I often tell people that marketing isn't brain surgery. It's not rocket science. And it's something that you actively have to do. You can learn about marketing, but unless you actually build a YouTube page, build a LinkedIn profile and things like that, it's very difficult to, to study about it because it's changing the whole time. So it really mm -hmm. is something that is you need hands-on experience to, to do it. And it's difficult to explain to people how to do marketing, unless you work at Coca-Cola or these large companies which have marketing plans dating back you know, 100 years and have huge budgets to be able to spend on things that they don't really know is going to generate revenue, but they've got so much money and so many sales behind them, the boat just keeps flowing on its, uh. on it, with its own energy. Okay, now I understand what you mean then. No one ever taught me I never took a marketing course, never read a marketing book. So from what I've been able to create so far, it was all through observation. What I did was I'm trying to like come across as a really high profile best-selling author, not just being able to say, hey, the five-day job search is a best-selling book on Amazon. Like I actually want to go ahead and sell millions of copies all around the world for this book. I want to be like the next Marie Kondo right, who wrote the book, The Magic Art of Tidying Up, something like that, where like everyone knows who you are. 
so what I did was I'm, I went in on Amazon and I looked at all the other books in my category for career, job hunting, self-help. And I just copied and pasted all of the author's names into a Google Excel sheet. I removed the duplicates because many of these authors wrote more, more than one book. And then I Googled their name. Every morning, I sat down for an hour and I just Googled their name and I opened every search result in a new tab and trying to like reverse engineer what they did. Why were they so talked about? Why are they so well known? What did they put on their LinkedIn? What do they put on their website? What are the typical pages the website needs? I wrote all of that down. What profiles on social media do they have? I wrote all of that down as well. And I noticed time after time that these authors have been on at least 100 interviews, whether it's a mix of news, written news, video news, podcast interviews, or simply written about by other bloggers, or they guest wrote articles on other publications. There was like a whole list of variety of links tied to their name. So I, I decided, okay, I'm just gonna copy what they did. <laughs> well, I, I yeah. think I know what your next book's going to be like. How uh, to market thousand, a book. <laughs> <laughs> thousand and one ways to become an Amazon bestseller. I mean, the or one way. You, you've done all of the hard work. I think lots of people think that it's as you had the luck of getting all of the that nearly a million views on that one viral video. I've had that with an article of mine. It blew up enormously. And then I haven't ever had that success again. I was like, what have I done wrong? My other articles are just as good. They're probably <laughs> better. And that one exploded. But it's a long game. You're going to be an overnight success in five years, Annie, because that's typically how long it takes to build up that credibility, build up those links, build up that engagement. And it's very difficult to shortcut that, those steps. And I think you're going about it the right way. One thing that I'd encourage listeners to think about is copy any, like you were copying the others, in terms of do your homework and read. You cannot become a, an expert in anything by osmosis. You can't put a book under your pillow and expect it to seep into your brain. You've actually got to read it and, and go through it. So I really love that you try to dissect how these folks became successful. I would honestly encourage you to write your next book on how maybe pick a few of those folks and say, these are how they became successful. These are the tips and tricks you can use but that will perhaps set you on the right path. I think that might be quite an exciting yeah. next article. And maybe that will give you your millions and millions of... Yeah, um, many people have said my third book should be all about how to market a book. <laughs> like, that apparently has been a very common thing people have told me. Well, I've seen, I think half the podcasts out there are how to do a podcast, and that really annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> so half the people who want to do interviews are those kind of folks who, I've started a successful podcast, I can help you do it too. So... There is obviously a, a need for that. And it's quite funny hearing you saying, oh, my third book. I don't know how many people have said, well, on my third book or so you're already going down the right path. I want to talk about another important thing, which is networking in terms of building your personal brand. I recently sat again with my class and said they have to do five events before the end of the year. So before December, they have to do five networking events because I've asked them, are you networking? If you say you want to do this job in a particular industry, have you got a network there? No. And they ask, how do you create a network? So I start talking to them about LinkedIn groups. I talk about going to things like Eventbrite, going to Facebook, going to the company pages that they like and seeing what free events are out there. You don't have to pay for the majority of these events. And the important thing is to build your credibility and build your visibility in the market. If people have seen you somewhere, the likelihood of you being able to shake their hand or say hi to them the next time is much higher than if you've never done that. How do you do networking? What is your process of networking? I, I can't say I do anything special because my network, it's a weird thing because it looks like more people know me than I know them. 
it's not on purpose. I haven't actually spoken to people one-on-one. -on -one. It's simply a byproduct of having done my YouTube channel. And so many people, of, like fans of the channel, have added me on LinkedIn to the point where like, I've never spoken to these people. I just accept their friend requests. And then when I wrote this book, The Five Day Job Search, I actually messaged one by one 2,000 people and asked them if they would like to support me in my launch. Now, I don't know 2,000 people. I literally went in my phone book, everyone I've ever added to my phone book, even if I don't remember their face or how I met them, I texted, can you help me with the launch? <laughs> people on Facebook through all the years um, since high school that I've added, I, I texted them as well. And the LinkedIn, which is people I've never met in real life, don't know them at all. And surprisingly, LinkedIn, where I don't know these people, they're like, of course, we'd love to help you. I love your YouTube channel. I'm like, wow. So it's a weird, it's a weird thing where I'm more well known than I know the person I'm speaking to. So I, I don't think I can give good advice in that regard of like how I've done it. But if your students, like they're college students right now. Yeah. If I had to do it all over again and I had to give advice to someone of that age, the way I would go about doing it is like once they finish college, they're looking to get an entry level position. And how do you like position yourself for a great entry level position? So that you're already on the track of being seen as an expert in your sphere. What I would do is I would actually go on Amazon and I would bookmark the page and sort it from newest release in the category of like, let's say, I don't know, me, I read business books, right? So I'll be in the business section of Amazon's books sorted from newest release. And the book that just came out, I would contact that author. I'd be like, hey, I just saw you release this new book. And I read it like if you do, if you read one book a week, let's say you can do 52 authors, right? You pitch to the author. I'm doing a podcast or a YouTube or I'm writing an article. I like what you're doing. I read your book. I thought it was great. It was insightful. Can I interview you? Can I interview you? I have some questions to ask you. And this is actually the best way to do networking because those authors would be very much interested because it is free marketing and promotion for them. And you've already displayed interest in their work. You've read their book as well. Um, and then by the time you actually get down into the interview, you do the interview, of course, right? But you also get to interact with the author who is most likely an expert in their field, in their industry. So if you do like 52 of these, then after a whole year, you'll have tapped into 52 experts in the industry that have a very large network. And then by the time you're looking to get a job, you can tap into that network. If I had to do it all over again, that would be the most strategic, efficient option. Yeah. Well, I hope some folks take that to heart and I'll definitely tell my class, or hopefully they're all listening to this as well, because I do the same thing, go through my list. Okay. You need to watch, you need to watch, you need to watch, you need to watch. So a lot of people are too shy to reach out to their network. They think, oh, what are they going to think about me? It's a bit forward but you have to do it. It's what it's how insurance salesmen starts friends and family. And then once you've run out of those, you move on to, to people that you don't know. And that's the more tough part of it. I want to talk about how you manage your day or how you have a work life balance. Cause right now it doesn't sound like there's terribly much life balance. It's work, reading, work. Are you in the phase? Do you have phases where this is work phase? Do you see yourself in a life stage now that it is just work for a certain amount of time? Or how do you balance your life out so that you don't burn out? Because we're also in a wellness month at the moment. So talk to me about your, how, you, <laughs> how you keep your mental hellness in check with all of this hard work that you're doing to build your career. I have to say a large part of it is my husband. I'm the breadwinner of the family and he cooks all of my meals for me. He drives me everywhere. If I didn't have that, I don't know how I would get like my general life and errands done, basically. Because when he's driving me, I get to sleep in the car. I get to relax, right? But as aside from that, I think I have really good time management. So what I do is I'm at the beginning of the week, I make an entire list of everything I need to do. Not just for my work, but like personal. Like if I need to buy groceries, how long is that going to take? Two hours. If I need to call my doctor to book an appointment, 10 minutes. Like I, I literally write down every single possible task that I need to do, no matter how small. 
Even if it's something like, oh, there's a big co event coming up a month from now, but what do I need to do to prepare for that? The preparation of that, thinking about how to prepare for that event, the brainstorming of ideas for the event. How long am I going to spend brainstorming ideas? One hour, like all down on a list. And then I open up my calendar and then I just literally start shoving things onto my calendar. And there are only so many things you can shove in there because time is limited. But then I've learned to pace myself. At first, I booked too much in a day because I miscalculated how long it would take to complete a certain task. But now I've gotten a lot better at figuring out how long a task should take. And then I'll book accordingly on my calendar. And But even following this method, I still ended up developing health problems. I, I thought I wasn't stressed, but I guess my body was trying to tell me, you're stressed. Can you please stop? <laughs> you're pushing yourself too hard. So now for the last three months, Saturday is my off day. I don't do work on Saturdays. I don't answer emails. I don't check emails. I can even leave my phone on airplane mode. You know, I can shut my phone off. No, one's, no one can contact me. Yeah. That sounds a bit tough. No, no contact for them. I'm sure you're itching to get back onto your, <laughs> onto your emails again. My last question for you, Margarita. Annie. Your middle name. Oh, Margarita. Maybe oh, let's, maybe let's have a, yeah, let's have a, a quick chat about that. I see. So yeah, my whole life I've known, I've been known as Annie Yang, never used my middle name. It's a mouthful, Annie Margarita Yang. And then people are going to ask me, why Margarita? Why is it not Chinese? Why does it sound Hispanic? <laughs> <laughs> or like, oh, is it a drink? Did your parents name you after tequila? But uh, I had Googled Annie Yang back when I was around 22. I couldn't find many search results, of course, because there's like so many Annie Yangs in this world. And I decided, you know what? Going forward, I'm Annie Margarita Yang online. So people don't actually call me Annie Margarita Yang in real life, they say Annie. But on the internet, everything has to be Annie Margarita Yang because consistency is really important in, in personal branding. So now when people search into Google, Annie Margarita Yang, all those links belong to me. Like those are links I created. Or if I go on like another podcast host's show, the first one I went on, he made a mistake of writing Annie Yang in the title. I had to correct him and say, hey, it's okay if in the actual show, you verbally call me just Annie Yang, but the actual text that's written for the show notes and, and in the title has to be Annie Margarita Yang. Otherwise, yeah. Google isn't going to index it thinking I'm the same person. Yeah. Well, I, I had a, a fantastic interview with a chap called Kim Rosdeba, and he wrote a book called 20 Branding Queens. And hopefully that's somebody you'll get in touch with and maybe you can make it into his next book because all of those branding queens like Madame Clico and Oprah Winfrey and all of these folks took their names very seriously and doing exactly what you do, you have to protect that like it is a very valuable asset. So you, I, th I think you're doing all the right things, Annie Margareta Young. So I think you should keep at it. And uh, it has been a very excellent chat. I think some of the tools and tips and tricks that you have put forward could be very useful. And I think if anyone wants to build their personal brand and build their career, it can't just be on a hit and miss. You have to do the hard work as well. You need to read, you need to know about your subject matter, and you've got to consistently try and improve yourself as well and stay ahead of the pack. So I, I really, I can see that in you and I hope people can follow your example as well. Thank you, Nicholas. I really appreciate your high regard of me. <laughs> <laughs> Last thing I'm going to say is where can folks get hold of you and just maybe list your two books again they can get a hold of me on AnnieYangFinancial.com. Again, for the offer that I stated in the beginning to get a 10% off assigned paperback copy of the five-day job search, they can buy the book on AnnieYangFinancial.com and use the coupon code WONDERBRAND, W-U-N-D-E-R-B-R-A-N-D -E upon checkout. The other two books... Both of these books, 1001 Ways to Save Money, is only available on Amazon. The Five Day Job Search is available on Amazon, on my website, but also anywhere if you search on Google. If 
a certain store distributes it, you can buy it there. In terms of my social media, you can follow me on YouTube. Just search Annie Margarita Yang. It'll come up. And <laughs> I just made a TikTok this week. So please follow me on TikTok. It's Annie Yang Financial. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm going to do that right now. And I'm, I hope a couple of other folks from the podcast will do that as well. Annie, great chatting to you and um, good luck with your next book. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Have a wonderful day. Mm, come chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh, come and chat with